Home to the world's largest population of Muslims and consisting of over 17,000 islands and boasting the world's 16th largest economy, Indonesia is the largest economy in Southeast Asia and a member of the G20. Yet in order to save its position, it has to overcome several challenges. Much like the rest of the planet, Indonesia has not been immune to the human and economic impact of the coronavirus and must now face the challenges that lie ahead in terms of reigniting its economy to overcome the certain recession that's faced by many countries around the world. Ini semakin hari semakin meningkat ya. Sementara sosialisasi-sosialisasi mengenai Covid juga cukup banyak baik melalui media sosial, media nyata dan sebagainya berita dan sebagainya. Namun masyarakat masih ada aja yang tidak mempedulikan protokol kesehatan. Nah, mungkin langkah-langkah yang diambil oleh pimpinan kami ya adalah bentuk yang sifatnya ekstrim supaya masyarakat sadar ya, sadar bahwa Covid ini ada. The question really remains as to how will the Indonesian economy recover once the pandemic starts to actually die down? Well, for the president of Indonesia, Joko Widodo, the answer could be from a confident statement claiming that Indonesia will actually distribute its own vaccines before January 2021. <laughs> Kalau produksinya sudah siap, langsung diberikan vaksinasinya kepada seluruh masyarakat di tanah air. Hello and selamat siang. Welcome to Economic Divide with me, Kabatah Wei. In this week's show, we'll be looking at some of the challenges facing Indonesia and assess the impact of the COVID-19 virus on the country. We will also take a look at the potential logistical and financial implication of moving the capital city, Jakarta, to another part of the country. Now, we have had some of our viewers contact us recently, with many of them coming onto our show and sharing their stories with us, much like we saw in the last few weeks, with Susan Sproul talking about our Canada and Mustafa Mane, who shared his battle against land exploitation in Africa. So don't forget, this is your show, and you can join us too. Just send us a message on Twitter using the marker at sign ed underscore program. We look forward to hearing your thoughts and stories. Now, even for the largest economy in Southeast Asia, a recession looks like a formality, which the, with the Indonesian Q1 GDP slumping to its weakest point since the year 2001. Figures show that GDP expanded at a slower than expected 2.97% from the previous year, and much further down than the previous quarters, 4.97%. The Indonesian government has announced an aid package to assist in the post-COVID-19 era, with $46.6 billion pledged to finance the recovery, which in turn is expected to widen the current Indonesian budget deficit to 6.34%. The government recently announced that economic recovery and structural reform would be at the core of the 2021 state budget policy. One of the main sources of income for Indonesia is Foreign Direct Investment, or FDI, which, according to the UNCTAD's World actually investment report, which occurred in 2020, FDI has increased by 14%. That has achieved a total of $23.4 billion, seeing investment mostly in the form of service industries, including gas, electricity, and communications. With over 17,000 islands to its name, Indonesia appears to be one of the forgotten powers in the world, with the East Asian nation ranking in the top 20 of world economies. In fact, as a member of the G20, the nation yields a GDP greater than that of Saudi Arabia, with some analysts predicting that in 2024, Indonesia could have the world's fifth largest economy. Its main trading partner is China. Indonesia recorded non-oil and gas trade deficits with China of around 11.05 billion US dollars in 2019. The deficit was higher than the record from the same period of last year, of just 10.33 billion. Data from the Central Bureau of Statistics in China has shown that as of July 2019, non-oil and gas exports from China reached $24.73 billion, or 29.08, of Indonesia's total imports. On the other hand, Indonesian exports to China were only 13.68 billion, or 15.53% of total exports. 
BPS data further revealed that Indonesia's trade balance against China is in a deficit of around 1.8 billion US dollars. That number is lower than the record for the same month of the previous year of 2.07 billion. Indonesia's main source of income comes from coal, oil and gas, with around 12% of the world's coffee exports, 40% of the world's geothermal energy exports and some 51.7% of the world's palm oil, the latter being one of the most controversial products in the world. The reason for the backlash on palm oil? Well, for many environmentalists and conservationists, the notion of destroying lush rainforest to make way for palm oil plantations not only destroys the trees, but has also seen the world's orangutan population face near extinction as their homes are destroyed to make way for the palm oil trade. Much like many nations around the world, Indonesia was subjected to a period of colonization with the Dutch occupying the area from the 1600s up to World War II. Now, present-day Indonesia is now nearly 50 times larger than the Netherlands, with 15 times the number of people and with an economy three times the size of the Dutch. In figures, the size of the economy compared to its previous occupiers is an example of how colonial states can emerge from the shadows of their past. Indonesia currently has an annual economy of $2.39 trillion per year, compared to only $840 billion for the Netherlands. However, when we take into account the notion of GDP per capita, things look very different between the two states. With a much smaller population, the Dutch GDP per capita is at around $46,440 per person, compared to $14,000 for the Indonesians. Hence, demonstrating why some people in Indonesia are struggling financially, with around 25 million people in poverty in Indonesia, which amounts to around 10% of the population. In 1957, Indonesia realized that its capital city, Jakarta, was on the verge of facing a potentially devastating problem. Namely, the land on which it was built was beginning to sink. Add to this the notion of rising sea levels, then the problem becomes double, as the rate at which homes, land and buildings are being enveloped by the sea is at a quicker rate than ever. Some geography experts have created models that predict by the year 2050, some 95% of North Jakarta could be permanently submerged underwater should the sea levels continue to rise at the current rate, on top of the sinking foundations of the land on which Jakarta sits. Add to the problem the notion of global warming, and Jakarta sees its problem is somehow self-fueled, in that Jakarta is the most polluted major city in the region, with an average air quality index, or AQI, of 161. The two main reasons for the elevated pollution levels in the city are a combination of both the heavy and congested traffic in the town, as well as the fact that there are 12 coal-fired power plants within a 100 km radius of the city, and as we all know, coal is the most pollutant of all fossil fuels. It's hence why then there's this idea of moving Jakarta to East Kalimantan. However, according to Anne Booth, an emeritus professor of economics and specialist on Indonesian economics from SOAS University in London, many Indonesians think that the idea of moving the capital is an expensive waste of money. Professor Booth also goes on to mention that Jakarta always has and will remain the commercial centre of the country, whatever happens and that moving civil service offices to another part of the state will have a minimal effect on the city's pollution level, as most people in Jakarta don't work for the government or civil service. Joining me in the studio today is Dr. Jacqueline Hicks from the University of Nottingham. She's currently a Mary Curry Fellow at the Department of Politics, researching Indonesia's data economy. She teaches Southeast Asian politics and has lived in Indonesia for eight years, working in political risk analysis, journalism, and development. Dr. Hicks, many thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So first up, uh, the coronavirus has hit uh, economies around the world pretty hard. Um, Indonesia is no exception, um, which is the world's 16th largest economy. How has it coped with this virus? Are we looking at a recession? And if so, how will the nation recover, you think? 
Right. So there has been a contraction in Indonesia's economy, um, but I don't think it's going to expand into a longer term recession. Uh, there was a contraction of around 5% in the last quarter, uh, unemployment has gone up quite substantially and there's been a reduction in investment and consumer spending uh, and things like that. But I think Indonesia is in a good position to rebound next year, really. Um, they have had really good growth um, pre-COVID and um, they have quite a low debt ratio um, so even though the government is having to spend quite a lot of money, it's doing that from quite a solid base. Well, moving into the regional role that Indonesia plays, obviously it's a huge Islamic population. How then does Indonesia actually interact and trade with its regional partners? Are there any major factors involved here? Yeah, so Indonesia is the largest economy in Southeast Asia. Uh, it makes up about a third of the region's GDP. Um, it's really been a central key actor in the region's economic bloc in ASEAN. Um, there are good relationships between the countries um, in ASEAN. Uh, mostly because the countries don't really interfere in each other's uh, domestic politics. But some would say, you know, that maybe they don't interfere enough because as a majority Muslim country, uh, Indonesia could have had a stronger voice in uh, protecting the uh, minority Muslim populations who are under state attack around the region. So that's the Rohingyas in Myanmar and the Uyghurs in China, for example. Um, but, you know, generally good uh, and steady growth in the economic, the trade and investment relations in the region. But the main partner for Indonesia is China. And um, that's the strongest relationship and that's only set to grow. And finally, there has been some discussion that the current president wanted to move the capital city actually away from, uh, from Jakarta to uh, another section of uh, Indonesia due to the overcrowding, sinking and pollution. Just how realistic do you think this notion is? Yeah, look, uh, this idea has been around for decades, really, and for good reason. It's not just about the, um, the flooding and the traffic congestion. It's also to try and distribute the wealth a bit beyond um, the central island of Java. Uh, the current president is self-styled as an in the infrastructure president. So he's been busy building lots of roads and rails and ports. And um, building a new capital city would really be the cherry on the cake for him. Um, but he, you know, there is going to be a lot of disruption because of COVID, not just in spending, but also in timelines. And if it looks like the capital city can't be built in time for him leaving office, then there might be less incentive um, for him to start seriously on building it. Great. Many thanks to you, Dr. Jacqueline Hicks, uh, there from the University of Nottingham. It's been great having you with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Dr. Jacqueline Hicks there. Okay, we're about to take a quick break here on Economic Divide, but don't go anywhere as we have plenty more coming up. We're going to be joined by Mahan Abedin, who will be taking us through a few of his stories found on the world of social media. Also look at how the COVID-19 virus has had an impact on the Indonesian economy, as well as a look at Islam and the economy in the world's largest Muslim population. And we take a look at other headlines hitting the front pages in our regular info news section. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this short message. Welcome back to Economic Divide with me, Kaveh Tahwai. Time now to take a look at other economic news that's hitting the headlines in the front pages and websites from around the world. First up, Russia. This country is hoarding gold and currency like never before. 
In just one week, Russia's gold and foreign currency reserves surged by $1 billion. What is the rush? Growth was driven by a positive revaluation that was partly alleviated by foreign currency sales on the domestic market. Another possible reason? Russia now makes more money from gold than natural gas exports. On to the US. The new unemployment figures offer an array of hope for the recession-hit economy. Even though the rate fell to 8.4% in August, a closer look at the new figures reveal an alarming surge in permanent joblessness. That's permanent. That could pretend a prolonged recession if Congress and the White House fail to address it. And finally, another alarming consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic will push 47 million more women and girls into extreme poverty by the year 2021. That's in just one year, based on the United Nations finding. The report mentioned that it would end in reversing decades of progress to lift this demographic above poverty. And those were just some of the stories that caught our attention. Perhaps you have a story that you would like to share with us. Don't forget this is your show, and you can join us too. Just send us a message on Twitter using the marker at sign ed underscore program. We look forward to hearing your thoughts and stories. Now let's take a look at how the COVID-19 virus has impacted Indonesia, particularly with its travel and tourism industry. Much like every other nation in the world, the impact of the coronavirus has left a significant dent in the Indonesian economy. One of the main sources of income for the country is the business of tourism, with the island of Bali being a very popular destination for foreign tourists. In fact, tourism in Indonesia accounts for some 8% of the GDP and sees some 20 million visitors per year enjoying the beaches and attractions of the country, as mentioned, with many of them heading straight for Bali. However, the impact of the virus has left the tourism industry in a very difficult position for 2020, with many hotels, flights and tourist attractions suffering from the loss of income. Although at the time of writing this show, figures have shown that around 181,000 cases of the virus have been reported, with close to 8,000 fatalities, the situation could get a lot worse. When it comes to dealing with the virus on a financial scale, total spending to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 virus has reached some $49.63 billion, being approximately 4% of the GDP. However, Indonesia's stimulus is relatively low in comparison to other countries such as Japan, Malaysia, Australia, Singapore and the United States. The nation's main flag carrier, Garuda Indonesia, has also felt the impact of the virus and other debts, with the airline some $500 million in the red. However, the government's overall COVID-19 bailout of $43. billion will see the airline receive some $575 million of this money. The future for Indonesian tourism is, however, much on hold as the world awaits a much-anticipated vaccine. And then, and only then, will the tourism sector see any notion of a real recovery. Joining me in the studio today is our regular current affairs and impact analyst, Mahan Abedin. Mahan, thanks for being with us today. What do you have for us? Well, okay, so the first tweet here, we have uh, you know, a familiar theme, the shifting of economic power to the east, like Vietnam establishing itself as a high-tech manufacturing hub, Bangladesh garments, Indonesia benefiting from China's misfortune at the moment in terms of the trade war with the That's US. That's not going to be, uh, create any friction between Indonesia and China, given that China is its biggest trading partner? Well, not necessarily, because these markets are, are large enough to accommodate you know, competing powers. And also at the political level, Indonesia and China are doing relatively well. And China needs to keep Indonesia sweet because of all the commotion in that region right now and the U.S. trying to exploit divisions between different powers, in particular the friction between China and Vietnam. Vietnam, actually, from China's point of view, Vietnam could be troublesome, but you know, it's, it's too small, really, at the end of the day. Okay, let's yeah, move on to the yeah. next suite and see what you right. have for us. Yeah, so biggest economies over time, China being projected to overtake the U.S. in 2024, at least in GDP terms. 
Now, people have been talking about that for a long time, right? China superseding the U.S. and some would argue it already has done that mm -hmm. in terms of, of real economic power. What about power. Indonesia itself? I don't yeah. see it in the 1992. Okay, that's way too far yeah. back, but 2008. And then all of a sudden we see yeah. it uh, popping up here at number five. Yeah. Well, that's quite interesting, really, especially as it's, you know, it's uh, above Brazil because Brazil was being touted as one of you know, these big emerging economies, and it still is. But I think Indonesia's success story uh, is quite extraordinary. And sure, good, and, and good all, for them, all yeah. of this depends on how each and every one of these countries actually uh, yeah. come out of the COVID-19. So for China, yeah. maybe it has to some degree. Yes, and, and bear in mind, most of these East Asian countries haven't been badly affected by the pandemic. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, obviously China's on top of it, South Korea's on top of it. Indonesia suffered a bit, but nowhere near as much. As Interesting. The rest of okay, on very good. Issue. We'll end it on that. All Thank right. you very much for that. We appreciate okay. it. Mohan Abedin, our current affairs uh, impact analyst. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move on now and uh, take a look at the next uh, piece of uh, information that we have for you. And uh, that concerns the way that, uh, well, Islam has integrated itself into uh, the economy of um, Indonesia, given that it's, uh, it has the most. Uh, Muslims in uh, in Asia. How that works and is the subject of our next piece. With 267.7 million people, Indonesia is the world's fourth largest population, of which 87.2% of these are Muslim, making Indonesia the world's largest Muslim population nation. Now with such a large Muslim population, Islamic banking plays a major role in the Indonesian economy, with some 190 trillion rupiah or $12.8 billion of finance invested into Sharia banking. There are 12 registered Islamic banks within Indonesia, with the largest of them being the Muamalat Bank. However, the market share of Sharia banking has fallen dramatically within Indonesia with the country seeing around 50% of its banking conforming to Sharia law in 2011. Yet by 2015, the proportion was only around 10%, with conventional banking taking an upturn. One of the main reasons for the downfall of Indonesia's Islamic banking is the fact that such banks appear to shy away from investing and financing in infrastructure, something that appears to go against the so-called development president, Joko Widodo. According to the Financial Services Authority, as of July 2019, Islamic financial assets, which didn't include Islamic shares, amounted to around 1.359 trillion rupiah, or around $97.07 billion, a 5% increase from the beginning of the year. Its market share is hence around 8.7% of the total national financial assets. Now the surprising fact with the Islamic banking system in Indonesia is the comparison with other Muslim nations. For example, although Indonesia has the world's largest Muslim population, its market share of around 8% in Islamic banking is dwarfed by Malaysia, which sees some 20% of its market share invested into such a system, in spite of having a fraction of the Muslim population of Indonesia. With globalization playing an ever greater role in the world, one can only imagine that the future of Islamic banking may face ever tougher challenges ahead. With over 17,500 islands to manage, the economy of Indonesia seems to be one that is overlooked around the world, as many people automatically lean towards other East Asian countries when one thinks of the area. But with a large population and an abundance of natural resources around the country, Indonesia is a major player on the global economic scene, with its membership of the G20 being a prime example of just how far it has come since World War II saw the Dutch leave the country and Indonesia gain independence. With its main trading partners being the likes of China, Japan, the US and the EU, it is clear that Indonesia sits as the main trading hub for East Asia, and hence why it has staked its claim as a serious global commercial competitor. Don't forget, you can catch this show again online by visiting our website and clicking on shows where you can also catch up with all of our previous episodes at your leisure with our on-demand service. As mentioned throughout the show, we also want to hear from you. Have you got a story you want us to cover on the program? If so, get in touch with us. 
via our Twitter handle, at SignED underscore program, where you can leave us a message. We'll promise to get back to all of our viewers. That's just about all the time we have for today's show. So on behalf of myself, Kavi Tatway, and the whole team here on Economic Divide, thanks for watching. We'll see you again next time. Thank you.